Hello, and welcome back to Tangents on Cracked Spines. I appreciate you coming back. If you're new, I would suggest going back to the beginning of this series, as I do read public domain stories, and they don't quite fit neatly into one episode. As always, listener discretion is advised, as there are adult themes. We are currently reading Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and we last left off with... Victor deciding he did not want to create the woman, uh, the Franken woman, Bride of Frankenstein, if you will, and destroying it while the monster looked on. I'm still upset he doesn't actually have his own name. And the monster was like, are you really going to do this to me? And Victor was like, yeah, screw you. Well, fine. I'll find you on my wedding night. Or on your wedding night, rather. And Victor's like, oh, great, I'm gonna die. I'll go out fighting! He then goes and tries to dispose of the bits that uh, were supposed to be the Bride of Frankenstein. And, like, falls asleep in the little uh, dinghy that he's in. There's uh, weather going on, bad weather, and he winds up fine uh, with his little dinghy in a uh, on the coast of an Irish town, where he is then charged with murder. And it turns out that the person that he supposedly murdered was his best friend, Clairval. Now, he goes into one of his fits of delirium upon seeing this, which only makes everybody think that he actually did it more. Uh, At some point during his two months of delirium, uh, his father was called, came to the jail. They got, uh, they were convinced that he was actually not near uh, the town at the point of Clairval's death. He finally processes that grieving, and his father starts to take him home. Uh, We did get interrupted last time, uh, because I did not time manage very well. And we begin in the middle of chapter 21. I'm going to backtrack just a little bit, so I'm at least within a paragraph. It was midnight. My father slept in the cabin, and I lay on the deck looking at the stars and listening to the dashing of the waves. I hailed the darkness that shut Ireland from my sight, and my pulse beat with a feverish joy when I reflected that I should soon see Geneva. The past appeared to me in the light of a frightful dream, yet the vessel in which I was, the wind that blew me from the detested shore of Ireland, and the sea which surrounded me, told me too forcibly that I was deceived by no vision, and that Clairval, my friend and dearest companion, had fallen a victim to me and the monster of my creation. That's the other reason why they were like, oh, yep, nope, he killed him, because whenever his monster kills somebody, he immediately is like, I killed them! So, you know. I mean, and also, fair. Like, He's been a dick to his monster the entire time. If he had just loved his creation, none of this would have happened. Self-inflicted wound. That is unfortunately hurting everybody around you, you selfish, pompous ass. Pardon my French. It's not French. I don't care. I repassed in my memory my whole life, my quiet happiness while residing with my family in Geneva, the death of my mother and my departure for Ingolstadt. I remembered shuddering at the mad enthusiasm that hurried me on to the creation of my hideous enemy, and I called to mind the night during which he first lived. I was unable to pursue that train of thought. A thousand feelings pressed upon me, and I wept bitterly. All right, I'm all for a man actually, like, expressing his feelings. But this dude seriously needs a therapist. I know psychotherapy wasn't, like, 
really a thing at the time, or it was very brand new. I don't know my timelines that well. Numbers were always bad for me, unless they were mathematical. But honey, you need coping mechanisms. Ever since my recovery from the fever I had been in, the custom of taking every night a small quantity of laudanum, for it was by means of this drug only that I was enabled to gain the rest necessary for the preservation of life. Oh look, people have been using sleeping pills for forever. Oppressed by the recollection of my various misfortunes, I now took a double dose. Cause that's safe. Dude, you literally were a scientist. Mad scientist, but a scientist. It counts as science because he wrote down the uh, all of his steps and results. If it's not recording, if you don't record it, it's engineering. And soon slept profoundly. No shite. But sleep did not afford me respite from thought and misery. My dreams presented a thousand objects that scared me. You... You were able to dream taking that much laudanum? Well, I suppose it would either be no dreams or the worst nightmares ever. So, that makes sense. Towards morning, I was possessed by a kind of nightmare. I felt the fiend's grasp in my neck and could not free myself from it. Groans and cries rung in my ears. My father, who was watching over me, Perceiving my restlessness, awoke me and pointed to the port of Hollyhead, which we were now entering. Chapter 21. Oh. Apparently we were on chapter 20. Sorry. We had resolved not to go to London, but to cross the country to Portsmouth, and thence to embark to Har ha Havre? Havre? Javier? I don't know. Too many constants. I preferred this plan principally because I dreaded to see again those places in which I had enjoyed a few moments of tranquility with my beloved, Cl beloved Clerval. I thought with horror of seeing again those persons whom we had been accustomed to visit together and who might make inquiries concerning an event, the very remembrance of which made me again feel the pang I endured when I gazed on his lifeless form in the inn at... She didn't bother to name it. It's literally two dashes. The Irish town. Well, yeah, buddy, that's also like what grieving is. As for my father, his desires and exertions were bounded to the again bonded no it's bounded to the again seeing me restored to health and peace of mind believe it or not I do talk in kind of a roundabout way because I'm Pennsylvania Dutch but uh even that's a little bit for me his tenderness and attentions were unremitting my grief and gloom were obstinate but he would not despair Sometimes he thought that I felt deeply the degradation of being obliged to answer a charge of murder. And he endeavored to prove to me the futility of pride. Alas, my father, said I, how little do you know me? Human beings, their feelings and passions would indeed be degraded if such a wretch as I felt pride. Justine! Poor, unhappy Justine was as innocent as I, and she suffered the same charge. She died for it, and I am the cause of this. I murdered her. William, Justine, and Henry, they all died by my hands. And you wonder why you were brought up on murder charges. My father had often, during my imprisonment, heard me make the same assertion. When I thus accused myself, he sometimes seemed to desire an explanation, and at others he appeared to consider it as caused by delirium. And that, during my illness, some idea of this kind had presented itself to my imagination, the remembrance of which I preserved in my convalescence. 
I avoided explanation and maintained a continual silence concerning the wretch I had created. I had a feeling that I should be supposed mad, for this forever chained my tongue, when I would have given the world to have confided the fatal secret. Yet still, words like those I have recorded would burst uncontrollably from me. I could offer no explanation of them, but their truth in part relieved the burden of my mysterious woe. Self-inflicted wound. Upon this occasion, my father said with an expression of unbounded wonder, What do you mean, Victor? Are you mad? My dear son, I entreat you never to make such an assertion again. I am not mad, I cried energetically. The sun and the heavens who have viewed my operations can bear witness of my truth. I am the assassin of those most innocent victims. They died by my machinations. A thousand times would I have shed my own blood, drop by blood drop to have saved their lives but I could not my father indeed I could not sacrifice the whole human race self important much but also if you wanted to confess to somebody like the catholic church existed and they have you know a vow to not tell people anything now like may well I suppose you pro could have been burned at the stake at this time so maybe confessing to the church wasn't the best option, but like, you wanted to die anyways for your sins, so it would work. Go to a Catholic church, get into a confessional, and tell the church. Something would happen. At the very least, you're You'd be able to spill your guts. The conclusion of this speech convinced my father that my ideas were deranged, and he instantly changed the subject of our conversation and endeavored to alter the course of my thoughts. I think my son is insane, so I'm just going to veer away from the topic that triggers it. I suppose that works. Hey, kitty. He wished as much as possible to obliterate the memory of the scenes that had taken place in Ireland, and never alluded to them or suffered me to speak of my misfortunes. As time passed away, I became more calm. Misery had her dwelling in my heart, but no longer talked in the same incoherent manner of my own crimes. Sufficient for me was the consciousness of them. By the utmost self-violence, I curbed the imperious voice of wretchedness which sometimes desired to declare itself to the whole world, and my manners were calmer and more composed than they had ever been since my journey to the Sea of Ice. We arrived at Havre on the 8th of May and instantly proceeded to Paris, where my father had some business which detained us a few weeks. In this city, I received the following letter from Elizabeth. To Victor Frankenstein my dearest friend it gave me the greatest pleasure to receive a letter from my uncle dated at paris you are no longer at a formidable distance and i may hope to see you in less than a fortnight my poor cousin how much you must have suffered i expect to see you looking even more ill than you were quit at geneva this winter has been passed most miserably tortured as i have been by anxious suspense Yet I hope to see peace in your countenance, and to find that your heart is not totally devoid of comfort and tranquility. Yet I fear that the same feelings now exist that made you so miserable a year ago, even perhaps augmented by time. I would not disturb you at this period when so many misfortunes weigh upon you, but a conversation that I had with my uncle previous to his departure renders some explanation necessary before we meet. Explanation. You may possibly say, what can Elizabeth have to explain? If you really say this, my questions are answered, and I have no more to do than to sign myself your affectionate cousin. But you are distant from me, and it is possible that you may dread and yet be pleased with this explanation, 
and in a probability of this being the case, I dare not any longer postpone writing what, during your absence, I have often wished to express to you, but have never had the courage to begin. You well know, Victor, that our union had been the favorite plan of your parents ever since our infancy. We were told this when young and taught to look forward to it as an event that would certainly take place. We were affectionate playfellows during childhood and I believe dear and valued friends to one another as we grew older. But as brother and sister often entertain a lively affection towards each other without desiring a more intimate union, may not such also be our case? Tell me, dearest Victor, answer me, I conjure you, by our mutual happiness with simple truth. Do you not love another? You have traveled, you have spent several years of your life at Ingolstadt, and I confess to you, my friend, that when I saw you last autumn so unhappy, blind to solitude from the society of every creature, I could not help supposing that you might regret our connection, and believe yourself bound in honor to fulfill the wishes of your parents, although they oppose themselves to your inclinations. But this is false reasoning. I confess to you, my cousin, that I love you, and that in my airy dreams of futurity, Futurity, you have been my constant friend and companion. But it is your happiness I desire as well as my own when I declare to you that our marriage would render me eternally miserable unless it were the dictate of your own free choice. Even now I weep to think that, borne down as you are by the cruelest misfortunes, you may stifle, by the word honor, all hope of that love and happiness which would alone restore you to yourself. I, who have so disinterested an affection for you, may increase your miseries tenfold by being an obstacle to your wishes. Ah, Victor, be assured that your cousin and playmate has too sincere a love for you not to be made miserable by this supposition. Be happy, my friend, and if you obey me in this one request, remain satisfied that nothing on earth will have the power to interrupt my tranquility. Except a monster. Do not let this letter disturb you. Do not answer tomorrow or the next day or even until you come if it will give you pain. My uncle will send me news of your health, and if I see but one smile on your lips when we meet, occasioned by this or any exertion of mine, I shall need no other happiness. Elizabeth Lavenza, Geneva, May 18th, 17-something or other. She doesn't fold out the dates. I love you, but I don't want you to be mine unless you really want to. I kind of actually am happy that... She you know, she's like, hey, you know, I'm going to do my thing and I will be happy with whatever your choice is because then it, you know, I would love to marry you, but that's okay if you don't. This letter revived in my memory what I had before forgotten, the threat of the fiend. I will be with you on your wedding night. Such was my sentence. And on that night would the demon employ every art to destroy me and tear me from the glimpse of happiness which promised partly to console my sufferings. On that night he had determined to consummate his crimes by my death. Well, be it so, a deadly struggle would then assuredly take place, in which if he was victorious, I should be at peace, and his power over me be at an end. If he were vanquished, I should be a free man. Alas, what freedom! Such as the peasant uh, enjoys when his family have been massacred before his eyes, his cottage burnt, his lands laid waste, and he is turned adrift, homeless, penniless, and alone, but free? Such would be my liberty, except that in my Elizabeth I possessed a treasure. Alas, balanced by those horrors of remorse and guilt, 
which would pursue me until death. Again, yes, I have some foreknowledge because Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is, you know, fairly popular. But his whole thing was Victor didn't love him or show any kindness to him, nor did anybody else. And he was jealous that Victor had Elizabeth. So when I will see you on your wedding night, I would not have been concerned for my own well-being. But that's how selfish and self-important this guy is. He doesn't think that even though this monster has literally killed by his own hand two, but in reality, three people to get back at Victor. And yet he still doesn't go, I should protect Elizabeth. Are you kidding me? Sweet and beloved Elizabeth, I read and reread her letter and some softened feeling stole into my heart and dared to whisper paradisical dreams of love and joy, but the apple was already eaten and the angel's arm bared to drive me from all hope. Yet I would die to make her happy. If the monster executed his threat, death was inevitable. Yet again, I considered whether my marriage would hasten my fate. My destruction might indeed arrive a few months sooner, but if my torturer should suspect that I postponed it, influenced by his menaces, he would surely find other and perhaps more dreadful means of revenge. He had vowed to be with me on my wedding night, yet he did not consider that threat as binding him to peace in the meantime. For, as if to show me that he was not yet satiated with blood, he had murdered Clairval immediately after the enunciation of his threats. I resolved, therefore, that if my immediate union with my cousin would conduce either to her or my father's happiness, my adversary's designs against my life should not retard it a single hour. In this state of mind, I wrote to Elizabeth. My letter was calm and affectionate. I fear my beloved girl, I said. Little happiness remains for us on earth, yet all that I may one day enjoy is concentrated on... No. Concentered in you. Chase away your idle fears. To you alone do I consecrate my life and my endeavors for contentment. I have one secret, Elizabeth, a dreadful one. When revealed to you, it will chill your frame with horror. And then, far from being surprised at my misery, you will only wonder that I survive what I have endured. I will confide this tale of misery and terror to you the day after our marriage shall take place. Yes, I'm going to tell you my deep, darkest secret that may make you hate me the day after my wed after our wedding. But he's going into that believing that he's the one who's going to die on his wedding night. So no biggie. He dies with his secret. For my sweet cousin, there must be perfect confidence between us. But until then, I conjure you, do not mention or allude to it. This I must earnestly entreat, and I know you will comply. In about a week after the arrival of Elizabeth's letter, we returned to Geneva. So who got there first, the letter or you? My cousin welcomed me with warm affection, yet tears were in her eyes and she beheld my, as she beheld my emaciated frame and feverish cheeks. I saw the change in her also. She was thinner and had lost much of that heavenly vivacity that had before charmed me. But her gentleness and soft looks of compassion made her a more fit companion for one blasted and miserable as I was. Well, that makes me a little happier that he's like, I would rather you have meat on your bones. But this was during a time frame when, you know, food was hit or miss, so... Having a little more weight did show that you were healthy. The tranquility which I now enjoyed did not endure. Memory brought madness with it. I'm pretty sure you were mad to begin with. And when I thought of what had passed, a real insanity possessed me. Sometimes I was furious and burnt with rage. 
sometimes low and despondent. I neither spoke or looked, but sat motionless, bewildered by the multitude of miseries that overcame me. Elizabeth alone had the power to draw me from these fits. Her gentle voice would soothe me when transported by passion and inspire me with human feelings when sunk in torpor. She wept with me and for me. When reason returned, she would remonstrate and endeavor to inspire me with resignation. Ah, it is well for the unfortunate to be resigned, but for the guilty there is no peace. No rest for the wicked? The agonies of remorse poison the luxury there is otherwise sometimes found in indulging the excess of grief. Soon after my arrival, my father spoke of my immediate marriage with my cousin. I remained silent. Have you then some other attachment? None on earth. I love Elizabeth and look forward to our union with delight. Let the day therefore be fixed, and on it I will consecrate myself in life or death to the happiness of my cousin. My dear Victor, do not speak thus. Heavy misfortunes have befallen us, but let us only cling closer to what remains and transfer our love for those whom we have lost to those who yet live. Our circle will be small, but bound close by the ties of affection and mutual misfortune and incest. And when time shall have softened your despair, new and dear objects of care will be born to replace those of whom we have been so cruelly deprived. Such were the lessons of my father. But to me, the remembrance of the threat returned. Nor can you wonder that omnipotent as the fiend had yet been in his deeds of blood, I should almost regard him as invincible. And that when he had pronounced the words, I shall be with you on your wedding night, I should regard the threatened fate as unavoidable. But death was no evil to me. If the loss of Elizabeth were balanced with it, and I therefore with a contented and even cheerful countenance agreed with my father that if my cousin would consent, the ceremony would take place in ten days, and thus put, as I imagined, the seal to my fate. Not in the way you think, but yes. Great God, if for one instant I had thought what might be the hellish intention of my fiendish adversary, I would rather have banished myself forever from my native country and wandered a friendless outcast over the earth than have consented to this miserable marriage. Yeah, honey, if you had thought. But as if possessed of magic powers, the monster had blinded me to his real intentions. No, I'm pretty sure it was your ego. Not the monster. Although the monster was a product of your ego, so, you know, whatever. And when I thought that I had prepared only my own death, I hastened that of a far dearer victim. As the period fixed for our marriage drew nearer, with death knells in the background, maybe a banshee wailing, whether from cowardice or a prophetic feeling, I felt my heart sink within me. But I concealed my feelings by an appearance of hilarity that brought smiles and joy to the countenance of my father, but hardly deceived the ever-watchful and nicer eye of Elizabeth. She looked forward to our union with placid contentment, not unmingled with a little fear which past misfortunes had impressed, that what now appeared certain and tangible happiness might soon dissipate into an airy dream and leave no trace but deep and everlasting regret. Preparations were made for the event, congratulatory visits were received, and all wore a smiling appearance. I shut up, as well as I could, in my own heart the anxiety that prayed there, and entered with seeming earnestness into the plans of my father, although they might only serve as the decorations of my tragedy. A house was purchased for us near Col Cologne? I would say Cologne, but it ends in a Y. By which we should enjoy the pleasures of the country 
and yet be so near Geneva as to see my father every day, who would still reside within the walls, for the benefit of Ernest that he might follow his studies at the schools. In the meantime, I took every precaution to defend my person in case the fiend should openly attack me. Hi, kitty. I have cats. I'm sorry. They want to listen. I carried pistols and a dagger constantly about me and was ever on the watch to prevent artifice and by those means gained a greater degree of tranquility. Oh, sounds like a Republican. Indeed, as the period approached, the threat appeared more as a delusion, not to be regarded as worthy to disturb my peace, while the happiness I hoped for in my marriage wore a greater appearance of certainty as the day fixed for its solemnization drew nearer, and I heard it continually spoken as of as an occurrence which no accident could possibly prevent. Yeah... Those are... That's always a red flag. <laughs> in your happiness. Elizabeth seemed happy. My tranquil demeanor contributed greatly to her calm mind. To calm her mind. I'm only a little dyslexic. But on the day that was to fulfill my wishes and my destiny, she was melancholy. And a presentiment of evil pervaded her. And perhaps also she thought of that dreadful secret which I had promised to reveal to her on the following day. My father was in the meantime overjoyed, and in the bustle of preparation only observed in the melancholy of his niece the diffidence of a bride. After the ceremony was performed, a large party assembled at my father's, but it was agreed that Elizabeth and I should pass the afternoon and night at Evian, and return to Colony the next morning. As the day was fair and the wind favorable, we resolved to go by water. Those were the last moments of my life during which I enjoyed the feeling of happiness. We passed rapidly along, the sun was hot, but we were sheltered from its rays by a kind of canopy while we enjoyed the beauty of the scene, sometimes on one side of the lake where we saw Mount Salve and pleasant banks of Montalguet. Again, I don't know. I'm sorry. I didn't look it up. And at a distance, surmounting all, the beautiful Mont Blanc, and the assemblage of snowy mountains that in vain endeavor to emulate her. Sometimes coasting the opposite banks, we saw the mighty Jura opposing its dark side to the ambition that would quit its native country, and an almost insurmountable barrier to the invader who would should wish to enslave it. I took the hand of Elizabeth. You are sorrowful, my love. Ah, if you knew what I have suffered and what I may yet endure, you would endeavor to let me taste the quiet and freedom from despair that this one day at least permits me to enjoy. Really, honey? You're, you're not in as uh, bad a shape as I am. Like, you haven't endured as much. You don't have the right to be, uh, to deny me being happy by you being. Like, you've been miserable this entire time, spreading your own misery to everybody you love, being the reason they die, and you dare say this to her? What an ass! Because, like, Legit, you're at fault for all of this, yes. But she has suffered too! She's allowed to be not happy. <sighs> Men. Be happy, my dear Victor, replied Elizabeth. There is, I hope, nothing to distress you and be assured that if a lively joy is not painted on my face my heart is contented something whispers to me not to depend too much on the prospect that is opened before us but i will not listen to such a sinister voice observe how fast we move along 
and how the clouds, which sometimes obscure and sometimes rise above the dome of Mont Blanc, render the scene of beauty still more interesting. Look also at the innumerable fish that are swimming in the clear waters, where we can distinguish every pebble that lives at the bottom. What a divine day! How happy and serene all nature appears! Thus Elizabeth endeavored to divert her thoughts and mine from all reflection upon melancholy subjects. But her temper was fluctuating. Joy for a few instants shone in her eyes, but it continually gave place to distraction and rever reverie. The sun sank lower in the heavens. We passed the river Drance and observed its path through the chasms of the higher and the glens of the lower hills. The Alps here came closer to the lake, and we approached the amphitheater of mountains which form its eastern boundary. The spire of Evian shone under the woods that surrounded it, and the range of mountain above mountain by which it was overhung. The wind, which had hitherto carried us along with amazing rapidity, sunk at sunset to a light breeze. The soft air just ruffled the water and caused a pleasant motion among the trees as we approached the shore, from which it wafted the most delightful scent of flowers and hay. The sun sunk beneath the horizon as we landed, and as I touched the shore, I felt those cares and fears revive, which soon were to clasp me and cling to me forever. Chapter 22 It was eight o'clock when we landed, we walked for a short time on the light shore. Again, sorry. We walked for a short time on the shore, enjoying the transitory light, and then retired to the inn and contemplated the lovely scene of waters, woods, and mountains, obscured in darkness yet still displaying their black outlines. The wind, which had fallen in the south, now rose with great violence in the west. The moon had reached her summit in the heavens and was beginning to descend. The clouds swept across it swifter than the flight of the vulture and dimmed her rays while the lake reflected the scene of the busy heavens, rendered still busier by the restless waves that were beginning to rise. Suddenly a heavy storm of rain descended. I wonder if she started the trope of rain being a bad thing. Or like being the thing that goes, oh, yep, yeah, nope, we're bad things follow. I had been calm during the day, but as soon as night obscured the shapes of objects, a thousand fears arose in my mind. I was anxious and watchful, while my right hand grasped a pistol which was hidden in my bosom. Every sound terrified me, but I resolved that I would sell my life dearly and not relax the impending conflict until my own life, or that of my adversary, were extinguished. Elizabeth observed my agitation for some time in timid and fearful silence. At length, she said, What is it that agitates you, my dear Victor? What is it you fear? Oh, peace, peace, my love, replied I. This night and all will be safe, but this night is dreadful very dreadful. I'd be like, well, thanks. It's our marriage night. Screw you too. I passed an hour in this state of mind when suddenly I reflected how dreadful the combat which I momentarily expected would be to my wife. And I earnestly entreated her to retire. Idiot. Resolving not to join her until I had obtained some knowledge as to the situation of my enemy. She left me and I continued some time walking up and down the passages of the house and inspecting every corner that might afford a retreat to my adversary. But I discovered no trace of him and was beginning to conjecture that some fortunate chance had intervened to prevent the execution of his menaces when suddenly I heard a shrill and dreadful scream. It came from the room into which Elizabeth had retired. As I heard it, the whole truth rushed into my mind and my arms dropped. The motion of every muscle and fiber was suspended. 
I could feel the blood trickling in my veins and tingling in the extremities of my limbs. The state lasted but for an instant. The scream was repeated, and I rushed into the room. Great God! Why did I not then expire? Why am I here to relate the destruction of the best hope and the purest creature on earth? She was there, lifeless and inanimate, thrown across the bed, her head hanging down, and her pale and distorted features half covered by her hair. Everywhere I turn, I see the same figure, her bloodless arms and relaxed form flung by the murderer on his on its bridal br buyer could i behold this and live alas life is obstinate and clings closest where it is most hated for a moment only did i lose recollection i fainted well yeah that tends to be your thing if you were actually ever in danger you would die because you would go, ah, a thing! Faint. Well, I mean, I guess it works for, uh, the possum. Maybe it would work for him. When I recovered, I found myself surrounded by the people of the inn. Their countenances expressed a breathless terror, but the horror of others appeared only as a mockery, a shadow of the feelings that oppressed me. Again, Yes, she was actually dear to you, so, like, this would affect you more. But they're still seeing a dead body in their inn. Or on their vacations. What have you. Your feelings are not more than anybody else's. I escaped from them to the room where lay the body of Elizabeth. My love, my wife... So lately living, so dear, so worthy. She had been moved from the posture in which I had first beheld her. And now, as she lay, her head upon her arm, and a handkerchief thrown across her face and neck, I might have supposed her asleep. I rushed towards her and embraced her with ardor, but the deathly languor and coldness of the limbs told me that what I now held in my arms had ceased to be the Elizabeth whom I had loved and cherished. The murderous mark of the fiend's grasp was on her neck, and the breath had ceased to issue from her lips. While I still hung over her in the agony of despair, I happened to look up. The windows of the room had before been darkened, and I felt a kind of panic on seeing the pale yellow light of the moon illuminate the chamber. The shutters had been thrown back, and with a sensation of horror not to be described, I saw at the open window a figure of the most hideous and abhorred. A grin was on the face of the monster. He seemed to jeer, as with his fiendish finger he pointed towards the corpse of my wife. I rushed towards the window, and drawing a pistol from my bosom, shot. But he eluded me, leaped from his station, and running with the swiftness of lightning, plunged into the lake. The report of the pistol brought a crowd into the room. I pointed to the spot where he had disappeared, and we followed the track with boats. Nets were cast, but in vain. After passing several hours, we returned hopeless, most of my companions believing it to have been a form conjured by my fancy. Maybe this was all just a fever dream. Maybe this guy was just insane. And maybe killing his own loved ones. After having landed, they proceeded to search the country, parties going in different directions among the woods and vines. I did not accompany them. I was exhausted. Yes, from fainting. A film covered my eyes and my skin was parched with the heat of fever. Because that is your go-to. Like, I don't know how you've survived this long in the world if whenever something happens to you, you pass out and go into fever dreams. For months! And it's not like they had IVs! How did you survive?
In this state, I lay on a bed, hardly conscious of what had happened. My eyes wandered round the room as if to seek something that I had lost. At length, I remembered that my father would anxiously expect the return of Elizabeth and myself, and that I must return alone. This reflection brought tears into my eyes, and I wept for a long time. But my thoughts rambled to various subjects, reflecting on my misfortunes and their cause. Their cause is you. I was bewildered in a cloud of wonder and horror. The death of William, the execution of Justine, the murder of Clerval, and lastly of my wife. Even at that moment, I knew not that my only remaining friends were safe from the malignity of the fiend. My father even now might be writhing under his grasp, and Ernest might be dead at his feet. The idea made me shudder and recalled me to action. I started up and resolved to return to Gen Geneva with all possible speed. There were no horses to be procured, and I must return by lake. But the wind was unfavorable, and the rain fell in torrents. However, it was hardly morning, and I might reasonably hope to arrive by night. I hired men to row, and took an oar myself, for I had always experienced relief from mental torment in, my, in bodily exercise. Then why are you not the fittest man in, on earth? But the overflowing misery I now felt, and the excess of agitation that I endured, rendered me incapable of any exertion. That's why. You're not the fittest. I threw down the oar, and leaning my head upon my hands, gave way to every gloomy idea that arose. You're allowed- I I'll give you a pass. You did just have several uh, losses at once. You do need time to grieve. I just think you putting everybody else down is not okay. If I looked up, I saw the scenes which were familiar to me in my happier time, twelve hours ago, and which I had contemplated but the day before in the company of her, who was now but a shadow and a recollection. Tears streamed from my eyes. The rain had ceased for a moment, and I saw the fish play in the waters as they had done a few hours before. They had then been observed by Elizabeth. Nothing is so painful to the human mind as a great and sudden change. The sun might shine or the clouds might lure, but nothing could appear to me as it had done the day before. Oh, well, look, a rhyme. A fiend had snatched from me every hope of future happiness. No creature had ever been so miserable as I was. So frightful an event in single is single in the history of man. I'm pretty sure that's not true, but go ahead. But why should I dwell upon the incidents that followed this last overwhelming event? Mine has been a tale of horrors. I have reached their acme. And what I must now relate can be... can but be tedious to you. Know that, one by one, my friends were snatched away. I was left desolate, my own strength was exhausted, and I must tell, in a few world, words, what remains of my hideous narration. I arrived at Geneva. My father and Ernest yet lived, but the former sunk under the tidings that I bore. I see him now, excellent and venerable old man, his eyes wandered in vacancy and they had lost their charm and their delight his niece and uh, his more than daughter whom he doted on with all that affection which a man feels who in the decline of life having few affections clings more earnestly to those that remain cursed and cursed be the fiend that brought misery on this gray hairs and doomed him to waste in wretchedness he could not live under the horrors that were accumulated around him. An apoplectic fit was brought on. And in a few days, he died in my arms. And that's where we'll end today. We've got one and a half chapters left. So next time will be the end of 
Frankenstein. I hope you enjoyed it and that my tangents didn't get too rambly. If you liked it, please hit that subscribe button, like, and review. You can leave voice messages at anchor.fm tangents slash tangents on cracked spines. There's a Facebook page called Tangents on Cracked Spines Book Club where you can converse, leave suggestions, and vote on the next story to be read. You can also visit me personally on Instagram or TikTok at FrankieCore92. I don't have time for Twitter. There, there's too much going on on that one. Thank you, and see you next time.